And at the very minimum, uh, if you don't like the recording, make sure that we can't see you and, uh, and just text your, your chat questions. Um, so we are, so now we are actually uh, recording. Um, Will we be able to get a copy of that at a later date, sir? Yes, we've been posting the recordings on the wiki site, the Fluid Wiki, on the mm -hmm. invitation. There's a link on, a, on the invitation that we send out or the reminder that we sent out with uh, uh, the URL to get to the wiki. And we encourage you all to not only visit the, the wiki to check out the recordings, but to sign up and start participating. We've got different project spaces in there. You're invited, everyone's invited to uh, create a project space. And if you need any help with that, you know, we can certainly provide that. Create a work, work uh, a workspace for a project that you'd like to work on and that you'd like to have others to join in as a part of a team. So there's a couple of workspaces there right now. There's a language workspace, uh, project space. There's one on um, uh, 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 virtual uh, graduations. Um, there are a couple of other ones. Go, just go there and check it out and see what you think. And all of our old, all of our past uh, workshop recordings are there for you to view. Um, and Moam has actually cre created a, a YouTube site and they're going to be there as well. Yeah, I was going to say that on that note, I'm going to put the um, link for our YouTube channel here and please check it out and please subscribe because then every time I add uh, the video for our meetings or any new videos that we are producing here, uh, you, you get a notification that there is a new video and you can check all the things you're going to be doing. So please subscribe. <laughs> And maybe what we should do is create a refresher for the uh, the wiki and show people in the schedule where they can access. It, that's actually a very good idea. Yes. Um, uh, Yuta, were you saying to actually do a little run through of the wiki now or to have a little run through that people can go through when they get to the wiki? Um, maybe we could even show that now. Yes. Let's see if I can go to it here. Uh, uh, do either of you have it handy right now? That you can easily navigate to it by any chance. She yeah, just I can do that. On One second. Okay, I'll take me a second to share my screen. <laughs> Oops, sorry about that. And actually, while we're waiting for that, uh, we've been kind of uh, working up a sort of a format for these workshops. And then the first part of the, the workshop is to actually talk about the questions that have come up uh, through the MMC at AAC.org email to Moema. Oh, OK, here we are. So um, this is the link that I sent. And one second, I, because I've got the other presenter here in the same room, there's an echo. So I'm going to just move a, into another room. Um, but this is the home landing cage. And as you can see, there's quite a number of menu items there. And uh, the schedule is amongst them. And that is where uh, you can find all of the resources from the various uh, presentations that we've given. Um, and one second, I'm going to... Uh, if you scroll down to workshop schedule, uh, there um, we have the, not only the um, PowerPoints, but also uh, related resources and then we have the recordings uh, for each week. And those are the same recordings that Moima has now put up on YouTube as well. So if you want just the recordings of the Zoom sessions, 
Um, you can get those at, at on the YouTube channel, but you can also get them um, here within the each week's schedule. In addition just to just that, a, a little have, thing. Sorry, um, uh, they're so, not. Sorry, uh, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Off my audio, oh. my mic, so I'm I'm not hearing my or not hearing anything from your end because I I didn't want it to echo. Oh. Um, if you go back into AHEC Home, um, as Al was saying, you can create, you can sign up, and all that it takes to sign up is to um, put in your email address and create a password. And then once you've signed up, you can contribute to the wiki. Uh, and um, and I, of course, have already got a, a login created, so it won't um, work quite as well for me to demo that. And I'll pass it back to you, Al. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Yuta. Um, as I was um, saying, so the first uh, activity for the workshop is basically Moema ask, er, responding to questions that have been uh, uh, presented to her through the mmc, MMC at at org email, email or for one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations that she's had with individuals. Um, so my, Moema, is there are there any questions you'd like to kind of answer to the entire for the entire group right now? Yes, I'm going to share my screen as well. And I just want to um, say something quickly. I have not yet put the links, uh, the videos yet on the YouTube because I just want to added the beginning and the end with our logo. So I just had access to it this weekend to download. So as soon as I have it downloaded and uploaded, I will let you all know. But we have other videos there for you to check. And as Yuta said, they are available already on our wiki page. Um, so let me just share here very quickly. So uh, today I'm going to address just two questions that have been asked me for some reason a lot, uh, not only here, but I, I hear it many times and I thought it was the most uh, important. So what I did is I created right here uh, this uh, page so we can just click there and this is what I'm, I've been doing. And I invite anybody to, uh, if you see a question on our chat or if you have uh, come across your students or colleagues, uh, questions that you hear a lot, please feel free to collaborate. Uh, that would be awesome. It, like uh, we, try to say every time this is a space for all of us, not uh, uh, just us. So please add and uh, edit, uh, add other suggestions, add other questions. Uh, that would be super cool. So uh, this question I always get, which format should I choose to export my uh, projects? So uh, it all depends on the, uh, where you're planning to screen your video, but we here are always talking about online videos and uh, MP4 and MOV are the best options because they can, uh, you can make them relatively a uh, small file and you still retain quality and you're gonna be able to upload to most platforms out there. Um, and then I added this uh, short, it's a very short, simple video that just go over a few other, uh, all of like a few, including these two uh, formats that you can take a look just to, uh, if you are curious to understand a little better how it all works. It's like I said, very simple, short, uh, very quick overview about it all. Uh, yeah, so, but the short answer is like exporting MP4 or MOV. Um, and another question that I get a lot is how to create a hyperlink 
for a uh, PDF file. Um, I get that question, I think, because sometimes we create too uh, PDFs that are too large or you want to just have it quick and available just to, to share with a lot of people or uh, you want to have sometimes uh, if you want to add it to your website like oh click here to to see this you can have a hyperlink normally if it's on a website you sh your website uh, where you're hosting it should have the capability of uh, just hosting it but uh, if you just did a hyperlink the best way that I found for uh, from all the ways I've tried so far is to just use the Google Drive uh, because even if you don't have an, a Gmail account it is a free service and uh, you kind of have more control you have control then of all your material because you can just go there and see it I will show what I did here very quickly uh, with one because there are websites that you can go upload it and get your uh, shareable uh, uh, link but then you're uploading it to somebody else's website so I don't know how comfortable you feel about that so I think I, I think I need to share I hope don't Okay, here. Can you see now uh, a Google Drive thing? Yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. So I just did this one as an example. I just went to my uh, desktop. I found the PDF. I just dragged it inside this. Uh, folder and on Google Drive to create a folder you just right click new folder create a folder so I create PDF files I dragged it here and to create a hyperlink you just right click and then you can get shareable link and uh, you can cop copy the link right and then here I put just as a viewer but you can even like people can change it if you choose to but if you just wanna like i said send it to many people you just go copy link right and done and then i'm gonna open another uh browser where i'm not connected to this just to so and then i go here press enter and then it's gonna be there you can send a, a a pdf as a hyperlink um, to other people so yeah these are the two questions for now if there are others that come up i will keep adding to that place so we don't have to wait until the next week and if you have any other questions again suggestions and wants to add there please uh, oh okay so uh there is a few questions here oh okay when your video is being processed in youtube it asks is it for kids or only for adults how to bypass when your video is for family and you welcome comment um i for a while was confused about that too. Uh, I I thought that when it asks uh, is for a kid, it, if it meant that a kid could watch it, if there was a problem if a kid watched it. Let me know if I'm answering the right way, uh, if it's the same thing. Um, so I all the time I would put yes, because it, this is in the educational film, there's nothing appropriate, a kid can see it. Uh, but afterwards, I started understanding that no, because then he would send me to other things and it was like, okay, no, uh, 
they're asking you if the content is specific for kids. So you you can just put no, and then it go, and then it, it should uh, solve it. Does it make sense? Is this does it answer your question? So, um, so I I teach the language and culture, uh, our Tana Atam language and culture, and so a lot of times um, I'll make videos for my students, my conversational classes for my students to use with their family, and I welcome them to watch it as a family. But when I've done that, when I clicked for kids, they, uh, it restricts comments. And so yeah. then when I've clicked um, for adults, then it has this disclaimer of, this is not for children or something like that. And, but, but I don't know, I didn't know how to, um, how to bypass that because I, and I understand why that's there. Um, but is, I noticed that people are somehow still able to have family content and have comments open, but yet, and, and so I'm wondering how do they do that when okay. they're, Upload. Uh, so does it open up the option of something more if you if you click no for kids is that what happens it, is there a third combined option no there's only two options for kids and only for adults yeah let me just double check here because i did the same thing and i thought i had fixed that um well Let's let I will go back. I will write that question down and I will get back to you so we can uh, Hold on. Thank you. You're welcome. I will put it on our list here. Oh. Sorry. Oh, we can't. It's so interesting. We cannot copy the things from the chat. But we're recording this, so I will have it regardless, but I will just write it down. Okay. Just really quick, I've read like every aspects of YouTube, like when it says more information, I've read the for only description in the support, I've read the for adults only description in YouTube in their support. And there's, I haven't seen anything that's for family. And that's why I'm asking those of you that post um, videos for your classes in YouTube, how you bypass that. Because it used to be that you could bypass the, you know, the, U, the old YouTube studio, um, it was a non-issue. So the but I understand the concern now and they had to do restrictions and how are you as, as you upload videos on YouTube, how are you bypassing that? And I'm okay with, if you're uh, gonna answer this maybe next session. Okay, uh, I, I just wanna show you something, for example, very quickly again, like one of the language videos, if I may share right here. Uh, this is your Gita here. Um, I, uh, I think that they just uh, came up with this pretty recently. Uh, when uh, YouTube started um, having a YouTube for kids application or channel. And uh, um, I, well, we experienced that ourselves because um, there's some crazy stuff on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Like, um, uh, for example, you know, kids watch Peppa Pig videos and um, there's some twisted up stuff like they, they would have that Peppa Pig animation and uh, um, there's some soundtracks or that, that they put in or, or some, something that, that even scared the kids a couple of times. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, once you get into that YouTube for kids, then those videos are blocked off from there. 
So, I, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they're still working on something like that. But, but you know, that is a, a little bit of an issue. I don't know. Because I think at the end, like this one uh, here, this is on the our college YouTube channel, right? Like I, I put it that it's for adults. So uh, you are there's no there's nothing that will tell you like uh this is a video for adults or, or for kids it's like you could still watch uh with your family and make comments and all of that i think the only difference is if if you are a parent who goes and restricts your kids view on their on their um uh, tablet, for example, they would not be able to get to this video on their own. But if you're watching it as a family uh, on your device, you can get to it and make comments and everything. But if the kid is searching it, they would not be able to get to this video. Mm. Does it make sense? But it's not going to show here the disclaimer or anything. It's just, and you can comment and you can do everything. Okay. Um, I'm also wondering if there is something in the um, channel settings that you might be able to do rather than, you know, any specific video that you're uploading. But I know that when um, we have our channel and, and the, there was something that had to be changed in the in the channel settings as you're signing out. No, oh, sorry, it's right here. No, you would not. They only give you like, like you're saying, they only give you those two options yeah they don't have anything else they um, do like uh they give you this in case right uh, then this would be if there is something uh inappropriate for uh, kids under 18 which in this case there isn't so then you could add one uh, an extra step but other than that it's if it is for kids, you put this, and then it says uh, uh, they give you more. Uh, they explain a little bit more of what's going to happen. If not, you just put it not, and and yeah, kids so won't Kenneth, be able to find it. Kenneth um, sent a great link to a discussion where it says. Uh, yes, it's made for kids. No, it's not made for kids. And then once you have uh, chosen no, then it gives you the option of yes, restrict my video to viewers over 18 and no, don't restrict my video to viewers over 18 only. And yeah. so you would, you would choose no, it's not made for kids. And then you would choose no, don't restrict my video to viewers over 18 only. Okay. It's here. Which actually you only have that option if you go there because normally it's already done for you. Yeah, because that bottom one doesn't show up in mine. Um, yeah, or at you, least you it didn't know. Previously. But I'm going to check it again and see if it does show up and then I can change it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you need to cho choose no, it's not made for kids. Then it gives you the option of. Um, whether to restrict it to 18 and over or not. Okay. Thanks, Kenneth, for adding that to the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I... we have we have two guests who were oh, yes. talking about captioning and description. I Can wonder. I be... Stop. Sorry. <laughs> yes. All right. No, not not to restrict the other <laughs> that are coming through or. The... <laughs> Yeah, no, I will, and I will address all the other, I will save these questions and address it later. Wonderful. Um, and I think Kenneth has added some additional, uh, very useful information to the chat, and I'm hoping everybody is monitoring the chat as well. And the, the chat will be part of the recording that we upload to the schedule. And um, yes, this 721 uh, recording is not up there yet, but I will um, look for Al's email with the link and I'll, I'll make sure that's added to the 721 um, date on the table of the schedule. Very good. Thank, thank you, Yuta. Um, 
Now, so I think we do want to move on to our guest presentations. Um, Charles Silverman from Ryerson University. Um, Yuta, would you like to do a little bit of an introduction for Charles or Charles, do you want to just dive right in? Well, I, I'll do a little bit of an introduction because actually we have two people here, uh, Charles Silverman and Rob Harvey. And uh, the, the reason why we thought it would be useful to have them here uh, is because someone asked about ADA requirements and accessibility requirements if you are teaching online, if you're creating video. And um, Charles and Rob will cover one of the requirements, which is for captioning. And this is specifically for students who are deaf or hard of hearing, but of course, um, the captioning and description um, are also quite useful for a number of other things and Charles will cover that. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Charles. Um, and he is an instructor at Ryerson. He's been working in the area of captioning for many, many decades actually. Um, and Capscribe is, one of the tools that has been uh, selected by quite a number of faculty as the most easy to use. So um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Charles. Um, Charles, we can't, I can't hear you. Um, no. Um, you're now I'll, now Charles, you're muted. While Charles finds his voice, I'll just say hi briefly. Uh, my name is Rob Harvey, and I, someone presented me yesterday in one of these sessions as the Gandalf of accessibility, um, which I, I supp suppose is better than a lumberjack or a Viking. But Charles and I go back a ways, um, and. Um, we also set up, we, we both lecture at various higher ed institutions around our part, our neck of the woods in south, uh, southern Ontario um, in disability studies, media accessibility programs and such. So uh, Charles, can you try again? Accessibility. Yeah, just waiting for Charles to be able to chime in and then I'll get out of his way. Um, so we'll let you know when we can hear you, Charles, and I'll just keep speaking. Uh, so we help entities ensure that they're, they're meeting various sorts of uh, legislation around accessibility. And for a long time, we've been offering media, oh, I think I hear him, media services, including captioning and description. And Charles is going to go a little into how to do that yourselves um, and go a little bit into the history of both types and what is captioning and, and, and what is the tool uh, called Capscribe. Okay, great. And hi, everybody. I'm sure we all feel a bit zoomed out these days with everything being so Zoom oriented. Um, I'm, I'm just going to jump into a bit of a slideshow. I'm going to cover, as Rob said, uh, a bit about capturing just in case. Uh, there could be things here that you're not familiar with um, or are. Um, and I'm, I'm not just going to mention captioning, but I'm going to cover some of the other things regarding media accessibility, and they are description and sign language. But I'm not going to go too deeply, go deeply at all into the other two. I'm going to focus on, on captioning. Okay, so I'll, I'll do a quick screen share. Um, And if anyone that isn't speaking at the moment could mute their mic, that would be great. Um, so let's go. Um, let's, so first I want to cover a few definitions because people can use the terms all the time. Closed captioning refers to captions that you can turn off and on. In other words, they're closed until you want them. There's a toggle somewhere, and you can open them. Back in the days of uh, tube TVs, if you will, analog television, how many of you still have an analog television? We have one at our cottage, and boy, is it ever vintage to look at with a VHS player hooked up. But closed captionings were available through if that was built into your TV and it was made after 1992, you could toggle the captions on, hence. Office closed. Okay. Um, 
open captions is when the captions get burned in. Um, they're part of the video. They're not separated. You don't choose them. They're simply there. And a, a lot of what Rob and I have done in the past, because there weren't many video players that properly supported um, all of the caption formats, is that we would burn when, when we had various clients and universities, we'd burn the captions into into the video. Uh, that gets difficult when you're talking about copyrighted material, but that's a whole different story. Um, COD is real-time captioning. You may have seen what you might think of as terrible captioning in a newscast, if you turn the captioning on on your, your device, or um, real-time captioning is what you will see, hopefully, when you go to a conference and somebody is providing it as an accommodation for people who are deaf or hearing impaired, or as I like to think, a hundred other reasons that you would want to be providing captions, like the acoustics in the auditorium are really bad. Um, you have a number of people who are actually over 50 and beginning to lose their hearing, or they've, they've blasted their ears from the boombox generation up to the iPod generation and beyond. Um, okay, descriptive video and is um, all about people who are blind having access to media. So if it's a counterpart to closed captioning. It's a verbal description of what is happening on the screen that I need to know that goes beyond the dialogue that I'm hearing to make everything clear and understandable. And Rob and I, I have found that with our clients, a lot of universities that for the most part, People are, have been ignoring descriptive video, but of late, over the last year or two, descriptive video seems to have caught on as an accommodation people are doing more of that. Um, there's live description, which uh, you may have heard of. It often takes place in, in, um, in better performances where there is a describer who is narrating live and people coming into the theater have are given headsets to wear. Okay, so um, captioning starts, started, of course, in a way, when uh, movies first made their appearance back in the 1890s. Um, you, had, um, you had title cards. Um, you had these, these, uh, this wonderful method of, of creating an equal um, opportunity for people with and without hearing to all share the same entertainment. Uh, it didn't matter if you were deaf, hard of hearing, or hearing. Um, everyone could read the titles when they went to a silent film. Um, and beyond that, um, back in, in 1928 or so, uh, the talkies began to come out. Uh, the deaf community, the uh, people who were hard of hearing lost that accessibility. They wouldn't get that back until the late 1940s. Um, and and uh, we've painted subtitles going on to movies. Okay, so why use captions at all? Uh, um, it's great for people with hearing loss, obviously, particularly in education, uh, it is, uh, where so much of the curriculum depends on, well, I know a lot of people who use YouTube clips that are relevant to classroom experiences. If they're not captioned, um, there's a whole accommodation consideration. But uh, captioning also makes things far, far clearer. It's another modality, so it makes things a lot clearer for all students. Students also who are coming from a second language background can find greater clarification. Students with learning disabilities can find that the captions um, help because of an added layer of information. Plus, you're getting correct spelling, hopefully, of people, places, and things. Um, captioning, uh, captioning is great for noisy background. It's great for quiet places. It's great when you're in a library and the mandate is you can't play audio and your headphones are broken. <laughs> and it's even, it's even better when our kids are told to do their homework and they want to sneak another episode of whatever their favorite show is and um, you know, they can watch the captions. Um, Anyway, there are a lot of benefits, but the one that may concern more people are the legal requirements than captioning. Um, uh, there's the International WCAG 2.0 standard um, that applies to web 
accessibility and capturing, capturing the requirement there. Um, there's also a lot of local and national legislation in the US and Canada and beyond. Um, okay. um, capturing finally hit schools in, in 1947 when people figured out how to paint subtitles onto film. And um, there were some terrible things that were made with um, captioning, like um, the Adventures of Will Willie Skunk. Uh, those of you who are old enough may remember suffering through these 16 millimeter treats. Uh, anyway, I'll move on. We're at the point where um, the um, captioning for Stan Brookhouse television has been around since the 90s. And most of us are familiar with that. But what's happened since is that we've expanded on our platforms. We have um, handheld devices, we have tablets, we have computers, in addition to um, flat screen digital televisions. And a captioning has come along for the ride. Um, most of it is done in the US, there are uh, legislative requirements for captioning on the internet, which is why CNN has captioning, Netflix has captioning, so forth. Um, even the videos coming from the Washington Post have captioning as part of their offering. And of course, everyone's getting these uh, little streaming de internet devices, um, whether it's um, the Fire device from Amazon or Apple TV, they too are bundled with captioning. Okay. And um, captioning is um, it benefits everybody, in, including including Caption Cat over there, who <coughs> and I have been trying to get our cat to to master um, benefit from captioning. It hasn't worked yet. Okay. Okay. So um, with digital media, there are new challenges. Um, education, online learning is one that you guys are most familiar with I, from what I understand. I've, I've taught online learning um, going back to 2001 and uh, just um, bending up and make an effort to make sure that our video content has been captured is really important. Some of the um, um, LMS providers now offer a way to get into touch, get in touch with caption companies through those learning management systems. Um, E2L Desire to Learn has something built in. Um, other platforms do as well. Um, as you know, social media has played a huge role. How many of you have not uploaded a video? Um, and how many of those videos that people really upload are captioned? And of course, you know that um, Automatic captioning, um, well, it's not that good. Um, and we've, well, we've had some crazy things with automatic captioning, and I'm just hoping you can help me remember one particular incident um, where somebody from Ontario had, had um, a, an avatar created with a talking avatar and she, I, I can't quite remember what she said. Can you help me with that? Oh, that's a little difficult for me to say, Ray. Okay, I will. Uh, it, it's, you will. it's better with the oh, graphic. Yeah, it's I'm much like, better with right. the graphic, but it it's much better with the graphic. But I, I yeah. shouldn't name names. But basically, uh, she announced that, that her name is Constant Sex. And it, it was. Um, um, and it gets it worse was, from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. And there are <coughs> caption bloopers that you can find on, on um, YouTube. Um, uh, Julia Child takes a real hit with her with a whole reinterpretation of the cooking activities. Anyway, um, a lot of people turn their material over to be outsourced. Our whole take is we, we think it's viable to think about doing it yourself, and we'd like to promote more of that and the tools we there are a number of tools out there. Some of you may be familiar with um, NCAM, National Center for Accessible Media. They're part of WGBH, Public Television in Boston. And they've been involved with accessible media for um, forever, really, since the advent of, of captioning back in 
open captioning, which appeared back in the 1970s. Um, Cadet is a, a caption and video description tool. It's, um, it, it's a little difficult um, to work with, but um, it's worth, um, if, if worth taking a look at. Um, YouTube Studio, um, some of you have tried to use. Rob and I feel that it's not for going two or three minutes over in terms of the content that you're using. It's, it's tricky, it's difficult um, to um, finesse our bias. Okay, so we want to introduce the Cat Scrub here, something that um, I've been working on and uh, Rob has joined in with me and together we built a company around CapScribe and we keep it updated. We like to give it away to educational institutions. Um, we've been doing that with, um, it's, we're more, as we are more mission oriented. Um, and CapScribe's model is basically six simple steps. You basically have to be familiar with, not with a, um, not with a video editing system. You basically have, Kafka has its own simple little interface. What you have to do is be able to identify the start point of a caption, write what you're listening to, lock in your end point where the caption starts, fine tune the in and out times to make sure that you're precise, and save what you've created and, and repeat. Just go on to the next one. So I'm at that point in, in here where I'm going to switch over to the actual CapScribe editor. So if you just give me a moment to do that between Zoom and uh, okay. Rob, you can divide Bill a while I switch to Zoom, if you could. I, I'm sorry, Charles, I can provide um... And entertain them. Uh, oh, um, like a good accessibility joke. Uh -huh. um, well, I, I don't think I it'll take you long. I could comment to, on the legal report. To the rescue. Well, you're sorry, go ahead. If you have a joke, Rob, that's sure, fine. Go, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I think uh, just as added context, uh, there are requirements and there's policies within um, almost any university or college uh, to provide captioning for video content um, and any audio that you provide online as part of the curriculum. So um, you will probably find within your college or university's uh, description of the accommodation needs and some universities and colleges actually provide other services so it may not be up to the faculty to uh, develop the the captions it may be um, provided by an accommodation service or a disability service but I'll turn it over to Charles to show you how you can do it yourself and, and frequently authors of video prefer to do it themselves because that way that it ensures that um, they but have the quality content they get the quality, they get the proper spellings in place. Um, it gets, it does, sometimes gets done more quickly than if it goes out. Or sometimes it goes out and it comes back and it's terrible. But nobody knows and students don't want to complain because they're afraid that if they complain too much, um, there's a whole dynamic where um, they're not being grateful enough and the service somehow disappears, there's that concern. Um, at Ryerson, the Library of Accessibility Services does a bunch of in-house captioning and for bigger things, they send that out to one of the one of the key vendors, probably some vendors that everyone who's in the States is aware of, Two Play Media and um, Rappos, the other one, the other one is um, Autosync. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm in the CapScribe project manager. So I'm going to create a, a new project and so uh, I'll say, I'll just say um, demo um, in the afternoon. And I want to grab a, a 
I, I could be grabbing a file online, but I've got something local, so I'm going to, going to go after that. And um, I have a video that I tend to use for demos because, hey, I'm the client. I have a severe profound hearing loss. And this particular one minute video is something that I, I know the audio by heart at this point, so um, it's easy for me to demo. And um, it's also, it, those of you who um, are fascinated by vintage television, it's an early 1960s ad for bounty paper towels. Something's haven't changed. Okay. Um, so here we are. Um, oops. And I am going to, um, so basically, Capscribe is set up with a, a video area. Um, can you guys see my cursor? Mm -hmm. Is that coming through? Great, great. Okay, yes. uh, there's, yes. a, there's a, a, a global play button, uh, which will play through the whole video regardless. But this is where I want to make my captions. This is where I select an endpoint or an outpoint. So first I'm going to play, and I have different ways of playing locally. So when I'm actually working on setting the times. I can just click and play and then click to stop, but I find it easier to press on the play button and let go when I'm done. It, it's more precise. Okay, so that's the beginning, and that's, that's an announcer. Um, Okay, so he said, oh, Ketchup, I know that I have some time in the beginning before he got to that. And probably about here, that created my out. So now I've blocked off an in bracket and an out bracket. I'm, I'm going to play that through to make sure that it's, it's what I think it is. And that's pretty, that's pretty tight and that's right in there. Now I get to add the caption and it goes up into my list of caption frames. So that was that's frame one. I can see what I've written. I'm in the remainder of the video now. I have all the space left. I have 50 seconds of space. So I repeat. And that's the sound effect. Um, popping down from ketchup bottle. Okay, um, and I'm going to press my out. I, I'm pretty confident that I got that, so I don't need to review it. I'm just going to hit the add caption and continue. And the women says, oh. Oh. Oops. And uh, let's press the out. I'll play back. That's good. Got that. Make the caption. I do too. Okay, so I've, I've now made an out. I've got the entire thing, but I'm, I don't want my caption lines to be that long. I try to keep them. I try to keep them under 35, um, 36 words, characters per second. Um, now I've forgotten what she said, so I'm going to replay it. Okay, so I'll write that out. Which form of invent a ketchup bottle? That's, and I don't want to go beyond that. Uh, there's a good spice for caption. I'm going to play up until um, she says ketchup bottle, and then I'll crop it. And that's my crop. Here's an out. Okay, and it's a wrap. Okay, and that's. Play it again. Okay, so that's pretty good. And I'll do one more because I think you get in the Okay, I'll do one more because I think you get in the idea. So now for, for actually 
not the end of the sentence, so maybe I'll do one more after this. Um, so confirming. Oops, it's a little bit too short. I need to reclaim some space. I'm going to undo my out. So there we are. That's better. And just to confirm. Okay, so there we are. Um, that's a bit of fine tuning. Fine tuning in particular is really hard to do with some of the other tools. Um, okay. Um, I wanted to play ahead a little bit now. I did that so that I would have a better understanding of whether this was a comma, or this was a period, or a dash, or um, what the continuation would be. But at this point, I want to stop, um, make my caption right here, create an out. <coughs> and I'll fix that. Okay. Now my out, my, my out is here. And okay, so let's do a playback. I'll go to preview. Um, this is how things would look um, in a video. Um, and pretty much on the web, video is fairly standardized now. Um, video is mostly MPEG-4 um, with a few variants of that. Like metric. Okay, so you get the idea. Um, now you may be wondering, those of you who have your YouTube accounts, YouTube has an infrastructure that supports captioning. And we can generate a caption file once this video is up on YouTube, you can then upload your caption file. That means that instead of relying on automated captioning, you have full control over the captioning on YouTube by doing this. So we're going to do an export. Um, YouTube works, recognizes a number of caption formats, um, but WebBTT is the most popular one of late. Um, it's probably staying that way because there's a WCAG 2 standard now. So I'm just going to do an export and a save. Um, so I simply do like demo here. And uh, that, at that point, my file, where did the demo go? Okay, this is the point where I wonder where it went to. Um, okay, try again. Ah, it went to a different folder. Okay. Um, And I did messed up on that again. One more time. Change the folder. A third time if you from. Here we go. Here's the VTT file. If you, um, it is basically a bunch of lines and time code, and that is one way to to get your material to YouTube. Now, if you want to just turn something over to your your university IT department to put up on their website, um, you can also export a playback kit that will play in a standard web, uh, any standard web browser. So just demo that here. Um, demo uh, at the desktop level. We're building the files. Okay, let's go to the desktop where those files have been built. Here we go. We have several things here. We have a sample HTML page, of a, that is a web page. So one thing you can do is simply launch that page. Um, 
Our screens are stuck on a different image. Charles, I think you need to change. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, hang on. Um, Okay. Here we go. Can everyone see the um, see the video on the on the browser website now? Yes. Is is that is that available? Is that showing? Uh, we see a blank screen with a play button. So um, good, 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 good. Okay, great. Okay. So, and, okay. And you can see the, okay, and you can see that the captions can be toggled off and on as well as the screen can be expanded or not. Um, the very last thing that I'll show you is that if you have a video player that supports web, web DTT, and many of them do now, not all but many, um, you can simply launch the Bounty video with the VLC player. And, uh, and okay, so that is my, that concludes my um, somewhat fast walk through CAFSCRIBE. I didn't show the description part, partly because we're not quite ready to show it yet, but CAFSCRIBE uses that same format to create description files as well. And what's interesting is we use synthetic voice as well as human voice, so that can speed up the process for a number of people. Um, okay. Okay, um, I, um, I think that's Thank you. it. Yeah. I'm happy, happy to take questions. Great. I think we have a number of questions and um, uh, one recurring question. Al, can you respond to Angelina I, um, regarding an August 6 deadline for certification? Um, certainly this is not relevant to any particular deadline. This is more to assist uh, faculty in creating their own videos and in, in creating captions and descriptions. Uh, but there may be some confusion about two different uh, requirements for faculty. Right. I am not aware of that deadline. I'll have to look into that. That might be under our other uh, faculty professional development program for online instruction. I, I'll look into that. That's not something I'm, uh, I'm involved with, uh, at least at this point. Okay, thank you. Yes. And I, I think that uh, Rob, our inclusive media and design is, is his name on the, in the chat, has been responding to the web VTT uh, question. And I wonder, are there other um, uh, questions that have not been responded to? Marshall, uh, N. Marshall, all TCU faculty might not be aware of the legality. Some have already utilized YouTube videos and then embedded in the online courses. How do we access the relevant information? Um, so the relevant in information regarding the legalities uh, uh, would be probably um, managed by uh, your whoever is responsible for accessibility and accommodations within your university. And frequently universities, once they require online um, teaching, they will make arrangements for the necessary additional services that are required to ensure that, that, that they comply with legal requirements. But maybe Moima can uh, respond to that question. Hi. Uh, yes, from what I am aware, and I will need to double check, I can um, check with my college and also do some uh, better research. From what I was, am aware, what is uh, required is that every video that is on the official website of your institution needs to be, needs to comply. Um, but now I need to check if you upload something 
for example, to uh, a platform that you're using, if that needs as well. And I will, I'm writing that question down to make sure, uh, uh, to make, to let everybody know. But if you're putting anything on your official website of your institution, you need to comply uh, with all the rules for, for accommodations. And what, what sometimes happens um, with universities and colleges is if it's a closed uh, enrollment, then the, um, you, can, you need to ask your students if anyone requires captions. And if they do require captions, then you would go to the, the um, accessibility services or an accommodation service. And there is funding federally and statewide and university system-wide to help you to do that. So uh, the, 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 there are different requirements for different situations. Um, the, the links that I put up there are for the uh, videos by universities that were made publicly available. As Moema said, they were on the official uh, website of the university. And so, um, hence the requirements, legal requirements, because there, what happens is you, you don't know who, or you are inviting anybody to come and look at the videos. And therefore, um, you have no way of knowing whether someone requires captioning or not. And um, by virtue of not providing captions, you are not providing equitable access to the videos. Um, but if it's a specific class and um, you, you can ask all of the students, does anyone require captions? Then uh, there are other alternative ways of, of delivering that. In, in theory, though, the uh, um, accessibility services would um, meet with students beforehand, before the beginning of classes, and um, get in touch with various um, course instructors so there's um, a bit of um, an opportunity, although the way that Ryerson does it, we sometimes don't know who needs accommodation until up to a week after, which means um, you're scrambling, working backwards to uh, do a lot of prep for that, which, which is why sometimes it's almost a better idea to assume that everybody can benefit from capturing. Why not, why not just make sure you have it and you don't have to worry about um, catching up with, with that requirement. One of the other things that uh, works well is if there is a uh, translation uh, tool that can be used, um, the captions give you a, a text version that is more easily translated into another language and that is then a, a gateway into subtitling uh, because once it's in text it's uh, the, there, it's much more reliable translation from text to text than from speech to speech. Uh, this is Al, um, question for Charles. Maybe you already mentioned it, but where, where are they now in terms of, in terms of the version of, of CapScribe? I was noticing that uh, there, there was some sort of a uh, uh, doing a search on the internet, it looked like there was some kind of a, 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 a gap there between access to, to the original and the release of, of version 2.0. But where are they right now? Rob, do you want to take that? Uh, great question, Al. Um, we started, uh, Capscribe was, was built by Charles over a very long period of time, I could say decades, it's am I safe to say that, Charles? Yeah. When I had hair, <laughs> and it's because of Capscribe that he has no hair. No, um, and uh, we we tried to maintain it or and or steward it and provide it uh, to users around the world uh, for a, a time, but it was reliance on the OSX or, or Macintosh platform only. That's mm -hmm. all that we had it on, um, given budgets and, and time, and it mostly uh, the blood, sweat, and tears nocturnally of Charles. And it was dependent upon that, which changed over time too. So the old Capscribe, which we just now refer to as Capscribe, the original, will cease to work with the next or the latest Mac operating system. Um, and so we were able to pull down some funding 
from the Canadian Broadcast Accessibility Fund and uh, to renew it, to breathe new life into it and also to make it platform agnostic or to run on various ones, as well as make it more accessible itself so that um, we're trying to be less hypocritical that people experiencing various sorts of disabilities, leveraging assistive technologies could themselves contribute to making content accessible. So Capscribe 2 is about to be released in the next month or so. We're just building towards a, a new limited release beta and would be interested in hearing back from people. One of the challenges with that is of course, we've just migrated the website and in the next day or so, there's a form that says contact us and it's not, it's not working because the mail server has to be rejigged slightly. So timing for today couldn't be any worse. Uh, if you were to go to the Capscribe <laughs> website, capscribe.ca or capscribe.com, but uh, we'll certainly leave an email message uh, uh, to Charles or to Inclusive Media. There's Capscribe. So there's the site. It's just that if you clicked on, if you filled in the contact us form, yes, I'd be very interested in taking this baby for a spin and letting us know what challenges you ran into uh, usability wise, otherwise, um, we'd be, we're all ears. I just typed in the URL and an email address to the um, Zoom group chat. So Rob might want to add to that. Oh, there you go. And there's what we've sent back. Right. Right. So and the same oh, and if I just to add one more quick thing. If there's anyone out there who's, who's really willing to put in the pains and joys of doing a pre-release bit of testing and playing around, um, let us know your interest. Great. And what we'll also put up on the wiki is the list of other uh, captioning tools that are there. So we have a, a sense of the, the various captioning services that are available, as well as um, I think uh, what I'll do is I'll do a little bit more research to see what is the TCU uh, policy and what services are provided uh, with respect to captioning and also description, of course. Um, and there are a, a, quite a number of different services that are available. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, certainly every, every tribal college has to be ADA compliant with, their, with the content that they provide on their, on their websites. And I don't think we've ever put on any kind of a workshop to make sure that everybody's up to speed with the current requirements and, and that the content they do have is compliant. Um, and it's funny, we did a little meeting. We, we recruited somebody from the New University of Oregon to work with Illisabic College about their uh, compliance issues because they were responding to uh, an accreditation um, site visit, I believe. So yeah, so I think this is a really timely conversation and we definitely do need to get more. Uh, it's funny how this MMC is, sort of evolves and, and grows. It's a kind of a, a scoping interesting scoping phenomenon, because that definitely is an, an important issue and we hadn't even, I hadn't even thought of it. So it's really good. Um, uh, I think we're, not, we're past our hour. Uh, okay. did, did somebody had a comment or a question? A very quick one. Um, one of the wonderful things about Capscribe is it not only does captioning, but it does description, which benefits people who can't see the information. So it helps you insert a narrative. And that as well may very well be an academic accommodation that's required for students needing that to be on an equal footing as well. Thanks. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Um, and I think we were going to need to wind down. It's uh, actually been over an hour for our workshop. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Charles. And um, I, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. It's uh, Rob. Thanks. Rob. Yes. Thank you both very much. Uh, definitely a very interesting and important uh, a theme or topic in, in media development. Um, we were going to talk a bit today about project ideas for collaborations, but I think maybe we'll, we'll put that off until next week. But please send your thoughts, and especially thoughts for topics that, that you'd like to have us to cover to the MMC at ahec.org email, which is actually Moema. So uh, I guess, again, without too much further ado, 
unless anybody has any final comments, thank you all very much for, I think, another great workshop. And um, actually, if I could just make one quick comment to lay <laughs> yeah. people's uh, um, peers, because I'm watching the chat. One of the other things that's really great is to en engage students in helping with the captions as well. It's a wonderful student activity, um, as I think Rob pointed out. But, uh, and we look forward to talking to more about student engagement and how to create interactive curriculum as well. That's very good. Thank you. And thanks everyone. Have a great uh, rest of the day and rest of the week.